up to this point we've only been dealing with ideal gases. Well, it turns out that all real gases deviate to some degree from PV equals nRT. The deviations are most pronounced at high pressures and or low temperatures. In other words, at high pressures when the particles are very, very close together and at low temperatures, that is when those gas particles tend to be moving pretty slowly, then the ideal gas law really starts to look a little shaky. Real gas particles, unlike the ideal ones that we've assumed, do occupy space. In other words, they don't have zero volume. They do have some measurable volume. It's tiny, but it is measurable. Furthermore, real gas particles do experience attractive forces. Those attractive forces become significant when at high pressures those particles are very, very close together and at low temperatures when they're moving very slowly then those attractive forces start to play a noticeable role. An ideal gas conforms to the ideal gas equation, PV equals nRT. If we solve that for P, it's nRT over V. A real gas conforms better to the van der Waals equation, developed by Johannes Diedrich van der Waals. And there is the van der Waals equation. We are not going to use that equation in any calculations. We're just going to try to explain some of the new terms and how we could rationalize the existence of those terms in the equation. One of the new terms is this minus nB term in the denominator, and that is a correction for particle volume, the fact that particles actually do have a small amount of space that they occupy. If particles actually do occupy space, Particles with some volume will exert a bigger pressure than those with zero volume. And you can see that this term, minus nB in the denominator, will cause the measured pressure to be larger. The other new term in the van der Waals equation is this one that I've boxed in blue. And that is a correction for particle attraction. When particles attract each other, that's going to make the pressure smaller than the ideal gas law would predict. And you can see, since we are subtracting that term, that that will, in effect, make this pressure that we calculate smaller. Let's try to explain this in a little bit more depth. Let's tackle first the effect of particle attraction, which I've circled here, the white circle at the top of the slide. This is the term we're dealing with. In the box here, we have two ideal gas particles. Now, I've just colored them different colors so that we can distinguish between them, but they're the same type of particle. They're both argon atoms or neon atoms or something. Now, if these are ideal gas particles, it says right here in the box, they have a certain mass, they have a certain speed, and they have no attractions for each other. This yellow atom is moving to the right with a certain speed. And if I put right here on the side of the container, this is a pressure sensor. When the particle hits that, it measures a certain pressure. If there's no attraction between these particles, this yellow particle is going to bump right into that pressure sensor and we're going to read some value. Now, let's assume that these are not ideal gas particles, but real gas particles. And real gas particles, again you can see at the bottom, have a mass m, a speed v, but they do attract each other there is a slight attraction. So that means when this yellow particle is heading towards the pressure sensor, if the orange and the yellow particles are slightly attracted to each other, then do you see that this yellow particle won't quite be moving as fast? And therefore the pressure that we read will be smaller. Now look at the upper right corner of the slide and isn't it true that this term would have the effect of reducing the pressure. So in short, a lower pressure than PV equals nRT predicts. Let's tackle the other new term. If we have ideal gas particles, these you can see are very tiny. 
they have a certain mass, they have a certain speed, but they have essentially no volume. In order to collide with sides of the container or with each other, they have to travel a certain distance. Real gas particles do have a noticeable volume, so I've drawn them much bigger. For these two to either collide with each other or collide with the walls, do you see that these real gas particles, they don't have to travel as far before they bump into each other, and they don't have to travel quite as far when they bang into the walls of the container, which means that real gas particles have a slightly shorter mean free path, and that means that on average there are going to be more collisions per second. And if there are more collisions per second, I think that's going to mean a higher pressure. And if you look at the upper right, notice that if you have this term that is subtracted in the denominator, you're going to get a higher pressure than what the ideal gas law would predict. The constants A and B are unique for every gas. Now it's not difficult to remember what A is related to nor what B is related to. A is related to attractions, particle attractions. So A is attractions. B is related to the volume, how much space the particle occupies. Not necessarily how massive it is, but how much space it occupies. So B stands for bulk. Volume is bulk. So B is related to the bulk, the volume of the particle. A is large when interparticle attractions are large, and B is large for large gas particles. Not necessarily for massive gas particles, for large, space-wise gas particles. Let's look at a few typical gases and their A and B values. Helium, we'll just look it up, has an A value that is 0 0.04. Now, what does it say here in our statement? Let's go back near the top. A is large when interparticle attractions are large. How strong are the interparticle attractions between helium atoms? And the answer is not very large because helium atoms are definitely nonpolar. The only interparticle attractions are London dispersion forces and there aren't very many electrons, only two per helium atom, so those London dispersion forces are very weak. What about for ammonia? What about the A value for ammonia? Well, ammonia molecules are attracted to each other by hydrogen bonding, so those interparticle attractions are quite large. Ammonia has a much larger A value. What about for argon? Argon atoms are attracted to each other, again, by London dispersion forces, which aren't very strong, but they're much stronger than the London dispersion forces for helium, but well weaker than the hydrogen bonding forces between ammonia molecules. So this trend seems to match what our statement here is, A is large when interparticle attractions are large. What about the values of B? B is large for large gas particles. So again, helium is not very large. The value for B is fairly small. Ammonia is a much bigger molecule, so it has a larger value of B. Argon, while its mass is about 40 AMUs, right, an argon atom has a mass of about 40 AMUs, compared to an ammonia molecule, which has a mass of only 17, but ammonia is for atoms with three bonds and an unshared electron pair that's only connected to a single atom. So it turns out that the B value for argon, in terms of space, ammonia and argon take up about the same amount of space, even though argon is much massive.